It is now time for oral questions. I recognize the member for London West. I uh, seek unanimous consent for the official opposition to stand down our leads. Okay. Um, the member for London West is seeking unanimous consent of the House to stand down the lead questions for the official opposition. Agreed? No. I heard a no. Once again, it is now time for oral questions. And I recognize the leader of Her Majesty's loyal opposition. Thanks very much, Speaker. My uh, first question this morning is to the Premier. In Vaughan, a COVID-19 outbreak at the Ravine Mushroom Farm has grown from one worker infected on June 27 to 24 this past Friday, and now 30 workers are infected. Let that sink in for a minute. On June 27, York Region Public Health was first alerted to one case. Ten days later, that's now grown to 30 cases. Many of the workers are living at the facility, meaning they're living with and working alongside their infected co-workers. Is the Premier satisfied that the employer has taken all precautions necessary to control this outbreak at yet another agribusiness in our province? Deputy Premier and Minister of Health. Well, I thank the Leader of the Official Opposition for the question, but I can certainly assure you that we are aware of the situation and that public health has reacted immediately, that they have gone in, that they are doing the necessary work with the workers on the, uh, the mushroom farm, doing the necessary contact tracing and doing the testing that needs to be tested. We can expect that as time goes on there will be periodic outbreaks of COVID-19 in different areas but our system has been developed to be resilient to be nimble to be agile and to move when it needs to do so and that's what's happened in this particular situation which is now under control supplementary question well, thanks, Speaker. Many of the employees at Ravine Mushroom Farm are migrant workers. In the past, they've formed organizations to stand up for their workplace rights, and now their infected colleagues are supposed to be self-isolating, and public health officials say there is limited chance for the infections to spread. What we don't know is if the workers are being properly housed separate from the other employees at the mushroom farm. Can the Premier confirm whether or not the employees infected with COVID-19 are being properly housed and what steps his government has taken to control the further spread of this outbreak on the farm? Minister of Health. Well, the safety of all workers in, our, in agriculture in Ontario is important, whether they are from um, other countries, whether they're migrant workers or otherwise. Everyone is important. Everyone deserves to be protected and to work in a safe work environment. That is why public health has moved in, has taken the necessary precautions, and is making sure that if there are patients that people that have been diagnosed as positive, that they are going to receive the care that they need, the testing is going to be done, and if there are groups that are together that are uh, positive, that they will be uh, quarantined away from the other workers at the farm until such time as they are uh, no longer symptomatic. They have been examined by a qualified health practitioner with an interpreter there if necessary, and that there is a plan in place by the employer in order for them to be kept safely in a separate area away from the other workers until they are well. The final supplementary. Well, Speaker, over a year ago, women who had been working at Ravine Mushrooms pleaded with this government to regulate the temporary agencies that sent them to work 12-hour days for as little as $5 once the agencies had collected their fees. Health officials warned that agencies that move workers from farm to farm could be contributing to COVID-19 outbreaks in Windsor-Essex. Sounds pretty familiar, Speaker, kind of like what happened in long-term care. Will the government commit today to regulate these agencies and ensure that workers currently employed at this facility have access to sick, sick pay and safe housing. Mr. Labour. Thank you, uh, and I thank the Leader of the Opposition uh, for this question. Mr. Speaker, the health and safety uh, of every single worker uh, in the province is uh, our government's uh, top priority. Uh, we uh, especially value those in the agricultural sector who continue to work uh, every single day to put uh, food on our table. Uh, Mr. Speaker, I'm uh, proud to say that uh, uh, since I launched uh, a blitz uh, in April of farms and agricultural businesses across the province, uh, as of uh, this morning, we've done 371 
uh, inspections. We've issued uh, 121 orders to improve uh, the health and safety uh, of these workers uh, on farms. But, Mr. Speaker, I have to remind the Leader of the Opposition that the Temporary Foreign Workers Program and the living quarters or bunkhouses of these workers Response. Uh, is the responsibility uh, of the federal government. But I'm proud to say that uh, two weeks ago, the federal government uh, did step up to join with us in local public health to begin inspections of living quarters for these migrant workers. The next question, once again, the Leader of the Opposition. Thank you, Speaker. My next question is also for the uh, Premier, but I would remind the Minister that the regulation of temporary agencies is your responsibility. Uh, speaker, the um, Premier expects parents and educators to juggle a pretty much impossible schedule coming September. Moms and dads are anxious about how to go back to work while the kids are at home multiple days a week or multiple weeks every month. And apparently, the government expects our teachers and educators to juggle teaching kids in the classroom while teaching kids at home on online at the very same time. Instead of keeping class cohorts small by keeping half the kids at home, will this government commit to hiring more teachers, educational assistants, and educational workers, like cleaners, for example, so that we can have more, smaller classrooms to protect our children from COVID-19? Minister of Education. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. What this government is going to do is ensure that we are ready for all scenarios for September. And the focus of the government is to ensure safety remains our paramount priority. Speaker, what we've asked school boards to do is to be ready for three scenarios. That is prudent given what we have learned from COVID-19. We must be ready for the challenges on the horizon. It is possible there could be challenges that manifest in this problem. And if they do, we are going to ensure the continuity of learning in Ontario. But, Speaker, our priority is to get kids back into class in a conventional model, day to day. That is the aspiration, but it has to be safe. I like to believe that would be a concurrent position from the members opposite. Safety must guide our position. And the Chief Medical Officer of Health, no less, sick kids and a variety of, of some of the best pediatric doctors in the country have informed us on this plan. It is why we've added more funding for, yes, staffing, $200 million through the Support for Students Fund, of which half of it, $100 million, what? is provisioned for more staff, more money for cleaning, more clear protocols. The aim, speakers, to get this right and to keep kids safe. And the supplementary question. Well, Speaker, parents all over the province are worried about the impact of reduced school days and lack of a clear plan or timeline for return, uh, what that's going to do to their families, frankly. They're very, very concerned. And some are even considering quitting their jobs because they can't get access to the childcare that they're going to need this fall. And by what the minister is saying, there's no plan. There's no plan for school. There's no plan for childcare. So how the heck are parents going to plan, Speaker? Last year, the Premier announced a plan to fire 10,000 uh, teachers. Will he commit today to putting teachers and education workers back in the classroom as part of a plan to ensure that our schools can reopen safely, safely for children, but reopen so that they can get the education they deserve? Minister of Education again. Well, thank you, Speaker. Indeed, schools are reopening in September. That is the plan that was announced by the government. But we did suggest and we did recommend and give guidance to school boards to be ready for all circumstances. That just so obviously is the prudent lesson learned from what we just went through in the province of Ontario. To have a credible online learning program that drives quality of education in the province should we need it. But the preference is every day in class learning. That is clearly what we want. I like to believe every member. But safety must be the prerequisite. And it's not the member opposite, it's not the politicians in this legislature that's going to guide the decision to get kids in class. It is doctors and public health. That is what our government believes. It's what we're going to continue to pursue with more training of our staff, with more funding of cleaning, with more hiring of custodial staff in the province. A hundred million dollars to hide upwards of nearly 2,000 custodial staff should school boards need it. Every board has more funding. Every board will have the support to succeed in September. And the final supplementary. Speaker, suggestions and recommendations are not plans, and what the public wants from their government is a plan. And so we look forward to when that plan actually arrives. Families need to plan for the return to school and to find the childcare that works uh, if they're going to be able to return to work themselves. And school boards are going to need support to deal with an increased need for everything from cleaning to a doubling of classrooms, and 100 bucks a school is not going to cut the, cut the uh, mustard speaker. Our schools and our childcare providers are facing an unprecedented challenge. 
and the Ford government's funding to boards, no matter how the minister spins it, and I, I can just predict he's going to be doing that again in a minute, in, is less in real terms than it was when they came to office. Why is the Premier shrugging off his responsibility to parents, to students, and to educators? Minister of Education. Mr. Speaker, it is this government that stood firmly in the defence of live synchronous learning over the past months when students could not be in class. It was the members opposite who opposed that, who thought it would not be in the interest of quality education to have an educator in front of, the te front of our students at a circumstance where they needed community and they needed support. If we're going to suggest about standing up for quality education, then stand up to all those involved in the education system to ensure quality is a universalized experience, not just in some schools, in every school in the province of Ontario. And, Speaker, why we are ensuring that we are prepared for the three scenarios in September is out of abundance of caution, because we just don't know the variability and the difficulty of not knowing what no government in this country, including our you know, Democratic colleagues in British Columbia, I mean, the reality is we have to be prepared for this circumstance. It's why Ontario, like virtually every province, is following a plan to be ready. But the that what the priority of the government remains to get kids in class with funding in place in every school board in the province, in Hamilton, in Toronto, funding is up. In fact, it is up in every one of our ridings by design to ensure it is safe, to ensure it is successful in the province of Ontario this September. Thank you. The next question. Leader of the opposition. Well, my uh, next question is for the Premier, but I would remind the Minister that uh, millions of families that have, uh, across Ontario have not seen a universal experience when it comes to education uh, in the last number of months, and they're certainly hoping for something of that nature uh, in the future. Uh, this uh, to the Speaker, or rather to the Premier again, Speaker. This morning I was joined by a woman named Susan McCarty, another Ontario uh, a person whose family was hit hard when COVID-19 tore through her long-term care home, uh, the, the long-term care home rather that her mother was in. Uh, that tore across our system. Both her parents were residents of Extended Care's West Park Long uh, West Park, West Park Long-Term Care Centre in Etobicoke. Uh, both contracted the virus and tra tragically her mother passed away. Susan has many questions about the failures of the for-profit company that did not protect her parents, but her top priority now is to ensure that she can see her father, who has survived, uh, and she wants to see him regularly and safely. Will the Premier ensure more safe, consistent access for families who are, uh, want to check on their loved ones in long-term care? Premier. Through you, Mr. Speaker, and to the Leader of the Opposition, yes, that's our goal, to make sure that people go in there and visit their loved ones. It's been very difficult for, for everyone, uh, especially the people that can't uh, visit their loved ones on the first floor. If you're on the second floor, and uh, we're doing everything we can to make sure that happens. I, I understand with, with my mother-in-law, that's happening this week. You're allowed to pick one person uh, within the family, supervised outdoor visit. So I think that's the safest way to go. We just want to make sure that uh, we protect the, the most vulnerable, which, which we have been. We've been doing that right from day one, doing everything we can to make sure, as we say, we put an iron ring around the long-term care homes. So hopefully people will be able to see their loved ones. Uh, hopefully this week, I understand it may be starting. A supplementary question. Well, Speaker, with no consistency and no rules, hopefully is not good enough for all of those people who are in anguish over having an opportunity to connect with their loved ones in long-term care. Once Susan's father was hospitalized, he was barred from returning to his West Park room, even though they continued to charge him $3,000 a month for his space. He spent a total of 14 weeks in hospital, during which, tragically, his wife passed away of COVID-19. Uh, so Susan was actually forced to choose between trying to keep him in the hospital where she could see him multiple times a week or moving him back to his long-term care home where she would be restricted uh, from comforting him in person for more than a few minutes a week. When will the government offer clear and consistent rules and ensure that all for-profit homes apply them fairly and consistently so that the loved ones of people in long-term care can actually get some time with the people they love? Premier. You know, Mr. Speaker, I, I agree. We need to have time to see our loved ones. But I'm not too sure what uh, Leader of the Opposition is saying. I'm not too sure if she's saying just to open up wide open and just let everyone go in there. We'll end up with the same problem as we, we had before. So they, they should be uh, outdoors. They should uh, have, have supervision there. 
And uh, that's, that's how these, these most elderly people and the most vulnerable people ended up getting this in the first place. They, they didn't get it by themselves. It came from outside, no fault of anyone's, be it visitors or, or anyone else. And that's what we're trying to avoid. We want to make sure that we protect them. And I think this is the right process. And I know each and every single long-term care, all 626 of them, are, are putting uh, guidelines in. And I think it's a smart thing to do. Let's start off slow. I, I understand the pain that people are going through, but it's, it's to protect the, the most vulnerable, and that's the reason we're doing it. Thank you. The next question, the member for Stormont, Dundas, South Glengarry. Thank you, Speaker. My question is for the Minister of Transportation. Our government was elected with a strong mandate to get Ontario back to work, and that meant putting people back to work. And that, that means getting things built around the province once again because there's no better way to get people to work, to stimulate the economy, to drive investment, and to create jobs. And getting things built, getting infrastructure built, means roads, bridges, highways, transit, and subways. These infrastructure projects serve our communities, and building them will put tens of thousands of people back to work. Our government is committed to restarting jobs and development for the people in my riding and throughout the province. Speaker, can the minister share with the legislature our government's commitment to get transit infrastructure built in this province once again. Minister of Transportation. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and I'd like to thank the member for Stormont, Stormont Dundas, South Glengarry, for the question. He is correct. Our government is focused on getting the province moving. It's how we're going to create opportunities for people, and it starts with getting shovels in the ground on major infrastructure projects. And that's why our government is investing. $2.6 billion in highway construction projects this year alone, Mr. Speaker. We're widening Highway 3 between Essex and Leamington from two to four lanes. We're widening the 401 between London and Tilbury from four to six lanes. And we're twinning the Garden City Skyway on the QEW into St. Catharines. These are just some of the projects that we're investing in. We're making to upgrade Ontario's highway system. And for $1 million spent on highway projects, we generate $660,000 in GDP. That's $660,000 in economic activity through direct and indirect construction jobs. Mr. Speaker, these are the kinds of investments that Ontarians need, and these are the kinds of investments our government is committed to doing. Yeah. Thank you. And a supplementary question. Thank you, Speaker. Back to the minister. Minister, those are vital projects. And the economic output you mentioned should put every make every Ontarian feel hopeful about our future once again. Now more than ever, these investments are cr critical to get our economy back on track. That's why our government is committed to ensuring that we help build our highways faster, because people are tired of potholes and people are tired of getting stuck in traffic. So we're going to repair, resurface and widen these roads. Our government is committed to helping put affordable home ownership within reach of more families. We know people are looking for affordable places to live, and we know people want to live close to transit, good schools, and good jobs. And this dream shouldn't be out of reach for so many people. Speaker, can the minister elaborate on our government's future actions on strengthening transit, transit infrastructure projects for our province? Again, the Minister of Transportation responds. Speaker, well, the member is correct. We are focused on getting things built because we're focused on getting Ontarians back to work, we believe that it is key to our economic recovery. Our plan for, delivering tr de for de developing transit-oriented communities will allow us to develop complete communities that are focused on connecting people to jobs and to housing that is safe and affordable. And much like our plans to deliver our four priority transit projects faster, we're developing the tools that we need to help us accelerate major highway projects as well. For example, by shortening the timeframes related to land assembly. Mr. Speaker, we will always treat people fairly and we will appropriately compensate landowners, tenants and others who are impacted by these projects. This will never change. But if we want to get shovels in the ground quickly, we need fast access to construction sites so that we can get, our, get shovels in the ground and we will, continue, we will do that, Mr. Speaker, while balancing the rights of property owners. But Mr. Speaker, our transit-oriented communities program and our Building Transit Faster plan will create tens of thousands of new, well-paying jobs and will make our roads safer, reduce gridlock, and give Ontarians more access to home ownership. Yeah. 
Thank you very much. The next question, the member for London Fanshawe. Thank you, Speaker. My question is to the Premier. After being isolated for the last few months, family members and staff have noted a marked decline in the physical and mental health of residents in long-term care. Family visitation was supposed to be the shining hope, but, the but many are finding these guidelines vague, arbitrary, and inefficient. Staff and family alike are asking why family caregivers need to get bi-weekly testing just to sit outside, six feet apart, with masks on while not even being allowed to touch their loved ones. It has been distressing for families to see their loved ones become inconsolable that their family is so close but still so far. Family caregivers are not just visitors. Will this government revise the guidelines to reflect that family caregivers are essential to the care of residents and their loved ones? Mr. Long-Term Care. Thank you, Speaker, and thank you for the question. Our government has been absolutely clear about its commitment to all residents of long-term care homes, staff and families, about the priority being safety, health and well-being. That has been absolutely clear. We have had a thoughtful process to understand how we can allow residents to have their visitors, as they so rightly deserve, and their families want this. We understand this. And that's why we have, in a gradual, phased approach, are allowing visitors back to see their residents, to see their loved ones, and eventually into the homes. And I remind everyone, we are still in a state of emergency. This is not a normal time. We must be vigilant and we must be adaptable. These are critical issues for families. The testing is, cri is critical to make sure that our residents are safe. Safety is the priority. And I appreciate your concern, and I want everyone in Ontario to know we're working very hard to make sure we can get uh, families together safely. And the supplementary question. Speaker, my question is back to the Premier. Not only are folks required to spend the time and effort to get bi-weekly testing, seniors are also having to spend money out of their own pockets for those same sorts of tests. A 92-year-old man in my riding was excited to see his wife of 65 years when he was told that he needed to get tested first. Hoping to avoid the crowded assessment centre, he asked his retirement home if they could perform the test on him. They said they could but for a $20 service fee per COVID test. That's $40 a month just to see his wife that lives in a long-term care home across the street. Why are seniors having to pay out of pockets to see their spouses, Speaker? Minister Long-Term Care. Thank you. I, I appreciate uh, the question, and thank you, Speaker. Just to make sure that uh, it is clear that retirement homes do not fall under the jurisdiction of, of the Ministry of Long-Term Care, but I'm, I'm pleased to, to answer that question. Uh, our government believes that the safety of residents, whether it's in retirement homes or in long-term care homes, uh, is a priority. Um, in long-term care homes, if there is information about someone being charged $30 for a test, I would appreciate hearing about that, and certainly we have action line with inspectors, and that feedback is greatly appreciated, and I would encourage anyone to let us know if that's happening. First of all, a home must not be an outbreak. That is the first criteria. Then we have to follow the protocol set by the Chief Medical Officer of Health and our health experts. That's an imperative as well. And the infection and prevention control standards must be met. These are not negotiable. So there are processes by which uh, our residents and families will be tested, including the staff. Uh, and I've asked to make sure that anyone going to a testing centre if they need a seat to sit on, a chair to sit on, some shade, that these be accommodated, that the, stair be, that the chair be cleaned. These are important measures. We must maintain the safety of our long-term care homes. Evidence and scientific knowledge Response. is evolving, and we must learn with all the processes that we have in place to understand the measures that are needed. Thank you. The next question, member for Ottawa, Orléans. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. My question is uh, for the Premier. Premier, cities and towns across Ontario are struggling under increased uh, public health expenses due to COVID-19, uh, lower user fees, property tax deferrals, and lower uh, transit, uh, transit ridership. And due to provincial inaction, 
uh, their options are bleak. Uh, municipal leaders will soon be forced to make what some Royal Bank economists have described as draconian cuts to important city services like uh, youth job training, public transit and, and public health. Or they can introduce massive unaffordable property tax increases that will cripple families and stifle the economic recovery. Either of these options will only hurt those who have been hurt most during this pandemic, uh, women, young people, and low-income Ontarians. So my question is very simple, Mr. Speaker. When will the government take action to support Ontario residents by supporting the, the towns and cities they call home? The Minister of Municipal Affairs and Housing. Uh, thanks, Speaker. And uh, through you, I want to thank the, the member for the question. I was proud to stand with uh, the Premier last week as we, uh, we increased uh, again our commitment to municipalities under our social service relief fund. We added an additional $150 million to the already $200 million fund, making uh, the total contribution to our municipal partners $350 million. But, but Speaker, I, I will take this opportunity to thank the Premier for his incredible leadership that he's done with other uh, premiers from other provinces and territories with his discussions uh, with the Prime Minister. There has been no one and I, and I want to stress the speaker, no one with a stronger voice than Premier Ford that is standing up for our municipal partners. He has been very clear that given the size Response. and the magnitude of this problem, we need the federal government to come to the table. I want to thank the Premier for his commitment for our municipal partners. Order. The supplementary question. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. I think the Argos are back in town, given how much the government's punting the ball to the feds. Uh, my supplemental is for the Premier. Uh, every day, millions of Ontarians take public transit to work. Many of them are essential workers, and as the economy comes back, uh, more and more people will be riding uh, public transit. Now is absolutely the worst time uh, for service cuts in public transit. Ontario's large urban mayors have projected a transit revenue shortfall of over $400 million from April to June. We're now in July, and nary a word from the government on supporting cities with their public transit needs. Uh, cities are going to be forced to either raise uh, fares or cut, or, or cut routes. My question to the government is simple. Will they support cities and public transit to avoid service cuts and increase in bus fares? Minister of Municipal Affairs. And well, thanks, Speaker. And again, uh, through you to the honourable member, uh, our government has been very clear right from the start that we support our municipal partners. The Premier and I and other ministers have stated publicly that we support the Federation of Canadian Municipalities and their ask to the federal government. We have stated very clearly that we support the Association of Municipalities of Ontario, the AMO ask that they've done in conjunction with CUPE, and we support the large urban mayor's ask uh, of the federal government. We will be at the table, Speaker, with our share, but we need, because of the magnitude of this problem, in not just Ontario municipalities, but every municipality in every province and every territory in the country, we need the federal government to join Premier Ford in asking for that desperate financial support. Response. The next question, the member for Mississauga Centre. Merci, Monsieur le Président. Thank you, Mr. President. My question is for the Minister of French Affairs. The, French, the Francophone community plays an important role by its language and by its diversity. I would like to thank the Minister for her contribution in public uh, conversations with uh, organization in Mississauga uh, about the help offered to Francophones in Ontario. Our help is needed more than ever. It's important for all Ontarians to have access to all type of information in their language. Can you tell all the members here what our government did to help those communities in those unprecedented times? Les Franco-Ontariens ont le droit de recevoir les communications Thank you. All the French Ontarians deserve to receive uh, information in their language. We have taken important measures. We made sure that we have information, uh, bilingual information about uh, public health. We have simultaneous interpretation for the for the daily press conferences uh, of the Prime Minister of the Premier. 
it was said that in the name of all the francophones represented, we thank you for your work because you allowed us to have simultaneous interpretation. It's the first in the, in the history of the province. You have contributed strongly uh, in the creation of those services for our community. I can tell you that we're trying to we're trying to make sure that we've learned from our mistakes in the past, and we want to make sure that all the French communications are being uh, ensured. I would like to thank the minister for her, for her reply. I have heard the French comments in my uh, city of Mississauga. I would like to talk about economic health. Knowing that Francophones are working on the economic development of the province, I would like to ask the minister how we are economically supporting the Francophone community, especially Francophone organizations. The minister. Our government knows how Francophone or organizations are facing a lot of challenges, and that is the reason why I was glad to act on this by sending, by helping, um, by going ahead with a different program for Franco-Ontarians. We know that Francophones need a lot of support, so in addition to that francophone program, we have invested $17 million to help all Ontarians, including Franco-Ontarians, to go through this very challenging time. We are working with the community to make sure that we go ahead in the best way possible. My advisory committee on the post-COVID-19 economic relief has given recommendations to help us go ahead with the francophone community so that they can flourish. Next, we have the member for Parkdale High Park. Thank you, Speaker. My question is for the Premier. Speaker, the Conservatives say that they've got a handle on testing, but I keep hearing from people in my community who are being failed by this government's new testing regime. Josh, a constituent of mine, reached out to say that despite having all the symptoms of COVID-19, he's been waiting for over a week for test results. Nobody's returning his phone calls, and his doctors don't have answers for when he'll get the results he needs to get back to his job. Speaker, despite the government's super agency, Ontario Health, taking over testing, it's clear they're still not getting it right. The Premier promised that they'd be laser-focused on fixing the antiquated health lab systems left behind by the Liberals. Why is this testing plan still failing those who need it most? The Minister of Health. Well, I thank the member very much for the question, but in fact, our testing strategy has been extremely successful, so much so that we are now averaging about 25,000 tests per day with the results coming in within 24 hours. We're going to increase that up to 50,000 because we know that as we go into the fall season with flu season approaching and perhaps a second wave of COVID-19, that we're going to need to do even more testing to determine whether people have COVID or whether they have the uh, usual flu, which can be deadly in and of itself. But our testing strategy is focused on several main areas. One is expanding testing to the general public. People do not need to wait for appointments. They can go and be tested straight away. We're opening assessment centers. We have over 100 of them now for people who want to be tested. We have asymptomatic surveillance testing in long-term care homes and other congregate living centers and an outbreak response management. And we've seen by what's happened with the, uh, the agricultural community, uh, including the mushroom farm in Vaughan that was recently discussed today, that the system is working. If you have someone who's not receiving their test results in a timely manner, I'd be happy to uh, obtain that person's information with their consent and follow up on it. Supplementary question. Premier. Speaker, people who have been tested are waiting for days or weeks to get their results back. Five, six, seven days of not knowing whether you have the virus or not is just unacceptable, especially as we move to stage three and more and more people get back to work and to their daily lives again. Without timely test results, it makes it harder for, to reopen the economy and it makes it harder for public health to contact trace. 
Speaker, if everyday Ontarians don't have faith in our testing system, how does the government expect to have faith in this government's recovery plan? Minister of Health. Thank you, Speaker. In fact, I would say through you to the member opposite, I don't understand how that can be in your particular riding that you have so many people that aren't receiving testing within a timely manner because we have over 96 percent returns across the province within one day, wow. maximum two days. So I do not understand how that can be. We have a, a, over 100 assessment centers. We have connected labs. We have over 30 labs that are doing the testing. There is no reason why there should be complete delay in your particular area. So I'd be happy to follow up on the specific issues that you have because we are increasing our testing capacity every day and our returns are within an, a maximum of two days. So I'd be happy to follow up with you. Thank you. The next question, the member for Lanark Frontenac Kingston. Thank you, Speaker. Speaker, my question is to the Premier. Like the COVID command table, our local health units are now embracing secrecy and behind closed door discussions with unknown people to make masks mandatory. The letter I received last week shocked me, Premier. The letter confirming mandatory face masks states, and I quote, a poll was conducted in Ottawa recently and 91% of the public who responded agreed with mandatory mask use in indoor public spaces. Speaker, to the Premier, why is the Premier allowing pollsters to run our public health system and create policies for us? Deputy Premier and Minister of Health. To I thank the member very much for his question, but I uh, want to assure you that any of the decisions that are being made by public health and by politicians are being made on the basis of evidence on scientific fact, not on polling. Polling is not the basis for the policy that is being made here. We are making policies for the health and safety of all Ontarians. We rely on the evidence and the information provided to us by not just Dr. Williams, our Chief Medical Officer of Health, but by a whole group of public health doctors who are specifically knowledgeable in this area and are among the, the, the best in the world. So that is what forms the basis of our policy, evidence and scientific decision-making. A supplementary question. Back to the Premier. I'll send over the letter from Dr. Paula Stewart, the Chief Medical Officer of Health for Lanark, Leeds and Grenville. The Premier has hidden behind the COVID command table for far too long. Behind these closed doors, unknown people are deciding the future of our province and our democracy. There's the letter confirming the new law. It makes face masks mandatory and it's based on a poll. No science, no evidence, no data, just poll results. We may as well hire a huckster or a pollster to make our COVID policies. Speaker, my question to the Premier again is, how much longer will he allow our democracy to be subverted by hucksters and pollsters? Premier. Well, through you, Mr. Speaker, I don't have a heck, I don't have a clue what he's talking about. I, I'm sorry, my friend, but he, he's he's out to lunch, in my opinion. And uh, we don't rely on pollsters; we rely on health and science. And what what that does, what what he's saying right now, is he's insulting every single doctor on the health table, every professional, public health, Ontario health. It just doesn't happen. I, I just can't even imagine some guy looking at a poll and saying, we're going to make a decision. The doctors don't play that way. Matter of fact, the doctors are non-political, absolutely zero politics involved. They're looking out for the best, uh, for the best health and safety of our, our province and our, our people. So I, I, I don't know. Even, I don't even have a clue what he's talking about, to be honest with yes, you. Sir. I don't. Thank you. The next question, the member from Mississauga, Aaron Mills. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question is for the Minister of Finance. In my great riding, Mr. Sagarin Mills, members of our community are eager to see Ontario economy thrive again as soon as possible. Throughout this crisis, I have been inspired by the resilience 
and the spirit of Ontarians. And as our economy continues to safely open, the strength, determination of the people of this province continue to shine. I know that the minister has seen firsthand the resilience of Ontario business community. Can the minister please share with the House what he has seen in the business community across the province? Thank you. Minister Finance. So, Mr. Speaker, through you, thank you to the member from Mississauga, Aaron Mills. Uh, I was here for the member's statements and just pleased to congratulate the member as well on, on the, uh, being the first Egyptian Canadian MPP and in introducing legislation. Hey around Egyptian Heritage Month. Congratulations on that. As our economy continues to reopen, myself and my colleagues I know are seeing the, uh, the benefits of that reopening. I had the opportunity uh, with the member from Mississauga Centre uh, to travel to see the work that was being done at Square One. Uh, back in June, before their June 24th reopening. And, and Mr. Speaker, I know we were quite impressed. Mr. Speaker, with the move to stage two across the province of Ontario, almost 160,000 small, medium, and large businesses across Ontario are able to reopen. Mr. Speaker, this is just the beginning of getting our province back on track in a safe way, and we look forward to that work continuing. And the supplementary question. Thank you, Minister, for the great job and great energy. The health and safety measures taken by the team at Mississauga Square One are indeed impressive. In my writing, many small local businesses have safely reopened by continuing to follow all the advice from our public health officials, like physical distancing, regular and through hand washing, and working from home whenever possible. Our government has long recognized the vital nature of small businesses to the success of our provincial economy. We know that now, more than ever, the success of Ontario economy depends on the strengths of the small businesses. Could the minister please inform the House about the positive developments he's seen in small businesses across the province? Thank you. Again, the Minister of Finance. So, Mr. Speaker, the, the member is correct. Myself and my colleagues have been seeing that resilience, that Ontario spirit that the Premier talks about so often. Uh, small businesses in my own riding of Ajax, Barrie, Innisfil, Vaughan, Peterborough, Markham, these are some of the places that I've had the opportunity with my colleagues to speak to small businesses. Uh, the member from Barrie, Innisfil introduced me to Stephanie Gourley, the owner of Discount Granite Plus, and she had some great things to say about how using the appropriate uh, protections for her customers, her business had been able to reopen. Just last Last week, the member from Peterborough Kawartha introduced me to Black's Distillery, and uh, a craft distillery who had answered the call by producing over 7,000 hand sanitizer kits, but now, uh, now their owner was churning Robert Black back to being a distillery. So, Mr. Speaker, now more than ever, we as members of this legislature net need to get out to see what our small businesses are doing, understand how they're adapting to the conditions as we prepare for Stage 3 so that the Ontario economy can come back stronger than ever. Yeah. The next question, the member for London West. Uh, thank you, Speaker. My question is to the Minister of Education. Speaker, Daniel Deans is a teacher from London West. Her daughter was in childcare, and her son will be starting JK. The shortage of childcare and the uncertainty about the school year is creating significant stress for Danielle, who wonders how she can go back into the classroom if she can't find care for her own family. Sue Pullum, also from London West, has five school-age grandchildren whose parents are returning to work. Sue's husband has a health condition, and like many grandparents, they can't be expected to provide childcare if school is part-time. Speaker, if neither educators nor parents can find childcare, how does this minister expect students to be able to return to school? The Minister of Education reply. Thank you very much, Speaker, and thank you to the member opposite for the question. Uh, indeed, Speaker, the government has uh, permitted child care operators to reopen the province of Ontario. We're seeing reopening happening in all regions of Ontario, including in London uh, and across uh, that part of the province. And, Mr. Speaker, they're reopening because the province has provided sufficient funding and operating supports, of course, uh, in conjunction and collaboration with the federal government to ensure they remain sustainable. But what we're also doing beyond ensuring the sustainability of our operators is we are providing an assurance to parents that that funding is contingent on a commitment by operators not to uh, not to increase fees on working parents and more so not to remove their space in the child care center. 
Mr. Speaker, we're going to continue to support parents through a investment that we're making to operators to ensure that they remain viable and sustainable. Speaker, child care operators are opening using a cohorted model of 10 students or eight students with two up to two ECEs. We're doing that, Speaker, on the advice of the Chief Medical Officer of Health. I would hope the member opposite would support the medical advice, support our plan to keep kids safe. Order. The supplementary question. Speaker, another London West constituent told me that his wife is an ECE and has been recalled to work. Their daughter had been attending the same childcare centre his wife works at, but spots were raffled and they did not get a space. Their other two school-aged children will also need care if school is part-time. My constituent has been working throughout the pandemic but is considering taking a leave from work to stay home with the kids. He was told by his employer that there are too many employees is already on COVID leave and he may have to quit instead. Speaker, does this minister think that forcing people to quit their jobs because they can't find childcare will do anything to help Ontario's economic recovery? Minister of Education. Speaker, the, the government is ensuring that we're able to recover from the challenges of COVID-19 with a, with a plan of growth in the economy to create jobs and to sustain the workforce. But, Mr. Speaker, we also recognize that in order to do that, we need to have a sustainable and a viable child care uh, you know, system in the province of Ontario. It's why, Speaker, when we implemented the Phase 2 plan, we also enabled child care operators to reopen. We did that with a commitment to fund additional supports for operating costs in our, in our child care centres. We did that, Speaker, with additional support for PP and for cleaning. We also did it with guidance on health and safety protocols, a clear plan to cohort children up to eight to allow them to play together and be as normal as possible together under this new COVID reality. Speaker, our plan is to ensure parents are protected. Order. Consumer protection placed by ensuring fees cannot increase and likewise the child space cannot be given to another person. That is what parents have asked for. It's what we're delivering in our plan, Speaker. Order. The next question, the member from Mississauga Streetsville. Thank you, Speaker. My question is for the Honourable Minister of Labour, Training and Skills Development. Now more than ever, people in my riding of Mississauga Streetsville and across Ontario recognize the importance of workplace health and safety. But such importance is not anew to those on this side of the House. Since forming government in 2018, we have taken many steps to improve the health and well-being of all people in our province. We have been clear that health and safety is our government's top priority. Mr. Speaker, every worker deserves to go home safe after a hard day's work. Can the minister please tell this House about what our government is doing to increase workplace health and safety in Ontario? The Minister of Labour, Training and Skills Development. Well, thank you, Mr. Speaker, and thank you to the member from Mississauga Streetsville for that important question and for her leadership when it comes to improving health and safety across uh, the province. Uh, Mr. Speaker, our government remains committed to encouraging a health and safety culture that protects workers and builds a prosperous province. One example of this is a program that I announced well before the start of COVID-19. The Supporting Ontario Safe Employers program is the first of its kind in the country. It rewards the businesses who go above and beyond what's required. I'm pleased to share that this program is now open. As businesses prepare to carefully reopen, we're rewarding them with $140 million for excellence in workplace safety. This program formally recognizes those who've successfully championed putting safety first in their workplace. But, Mr. Speaker, most importantly, this will help reduce workplace injuries and protect workers. And the supplementary question. Well, thank you, Minister, for that reassuring answer. I'm pleased to hear that we now have an industry-led program that promotes stronger workplace health and safety cultures. During this global pandemic, there's been a heightened focus on keeping everyone in our province healthy. <clears throat> Mr. Speaker. As a member of this House, I've been proud to support our government as we implement countless measures to enhance safety for our employees and our customers. It's evident that our government is sparing no expense when it comes to keeping people safe on the job. Could the Minister please share with the House more on what the government is doing to ensure people are safe at work? 
Minister. Well, thank you uh, again uh, to the member for that uh, excellent question. Mr. Speaker, we are doing everything in our power to keep workers safe in Ontario. We have now posted 139 sector-specific guidance documents available online at ontario.ca forward slash COVID safety. This page has had approximately half a million page views since going live in April. But that's not all, Mr. Speaker. We have also added 58 new workplace health and safety inspectors to boost our workplace inspections capacity. In addition, we have doubled the phone lines at our Health and Safety Contact Centre to help business navigate these very unprecedented times. Mr. Speaker, the member is right to say that this government will spare no expense to ensure Ontario's health and safety laws are properly followed and workers remain safe on the job. The next question, the member for Beaches East York. Thank you, Speaker. My question is for the Premier. Encampments of people experiencing homelessness have become a big issue in Toronto and other cities across the province. My concern is what exactly the government sees as the problem. The Premier recently admonished people living in tents in public parks or under the Gardiner Expressway, telling them, you can't do that. But in the middle of a pandemic, when shelters are especially unsafe for people with underlying health conditions, where exactly does he want them to go? Minister of Municipal Affairs and Housing. Uh, thanks, uh, Speaker, uh, through to the, uh, to the member. Uh, we are working collaboratively with the uh, City of Toronto on long-term innovative solutions to the homelessness problem uh, in the city. Um, last week, I, at the city's request, did a ministerial zoning order that would allow uh, a development, uh, a modular home development, that would allow uh, for 56 bachelor units. Uh, we're fast-tracking that so that it can be put in place uh, by September, and we are working uh, with the city on other long-term innovative solutions using the Social Service Relief Fund. As uh, the member will know, uh, we provided the city with a significant uh, amount of dollars in the first round of the social service relief fund, some $39 million. They were able to increase shelter capacity, help uh, with uh, adding $2 million to their rent bank. We will continue to work with them uh, on long-term innovative initiatives to help people that are experiencing homelessness. And the supplementary question. Thank you, Speaker. That was a drop in the bucket compared to what is needed. Back to the Premier. Order. People are intense because shelters are overcrowded and unsafe, especially during a pandemic, because there have been decades of cuts to mental health supports, because there isn't nearly enough affordable housing after decades of neglect by Liberal and Conservative governments, because systemic anti-Black and anti-Indigenous racism literally drives people into homelessness. People experiencing homelessness need to be safe or in spaces where they can safely isolate. The government needs to stop downloading the problem onto cities, especially Toronto. They can't manage it alone. Instead of admonishing people or advocating for encampment demolition, will the Premier support my call to declare homelessness a public health crisis and then act with urgency to get every person experiencing homelessness into hotels and housing during the pandemic and beyond. Minister of Municipal Affairs and Housing. Speaker, uh, the $39 million we gave to the city in the round one of the Social Service Relief Fund did help uh, with uh, some of the components that the member is talking about. Um, almost $22 million uh, was used by the city to expand shelters and to use hotel and motel rooms to do exactly what the member opposite has suggested. We are encouraging the city to apply under the second phase of the Social Service Relief Fund to continue the good work that the city did in round one. They used that very flexible uh, dollars that we gave them to help uh, with social distancing, to help with um, uh, amendments and, and changes to the shelter system. And that's in addition to the $118 million we gave to the city in 2019-2020 as part of our community home response prevention initiative. We will continue to work collaboratively with uh, the city. We will continue to advocate on their behalf to the federal government and, again, to the member opposite. If you have 
further suggestions on how we can collaborate with the city, uh, by all means, thank you. Thank you. The next question, the member for Mississauga Malton. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question is for the Minister of Heritage, Sport, Tourism and Cultural Industries. Mr. Speaker, Ontarians are adjusting to the new normal as the province continues to reopen. In fact, many great things that Ontarians enjoy doing with friends and family are open with caution, as health and safety measures are a top priority. Drive-in movies, enjoying a great meal on the local patios, which I did with my family, provincial parks and campgrounds are just a few examples. Mr. Speaker, we love sports. Research shows it improves our emotional, social, and physical health. And for my personal experience, when I say that Canadians and Ontarians are also incredible, excited for the return of professional sport, it's not only me who is excited about this. There has been a lot of buzz lately about when professional sports like hockey, baseball, football will be able to safely resume play, as well as discussion on what their health and safety measures will look like. Mr. Speaker, through you, to the Minister, when can Ontarians dust off their favourite jerseys and expect professional sports to return? Thank you, Mr. Mr. Heritage. Thank you very much, Speaker. I know the member. He is a fantastic member here in this assembly, but he wasn't asking for anyone else other than his son, Tree, who is really excited about uh, professional uh, hockey coming back to uh, the province of Ontario and, of course, the country. And We're absolutely delighted that this ministry has been able to engage with the uh, Toronto Maple Leafs organization, uh, as well as this member who uh, introduced me early on during the pandemic to Paul Rivet, who's the new owner of a co-owner of the Toronto Star, who's very interested in this as well. Look, uh, sports in Ontario represents $12.6 billion in economic activity. As of the 12th of March, uh, sports in Ontario was effectively shuttered, and uh, we're very excited that not only uh, with respect to our professional sports, but also our local community sports and minor sports is also going to be up and running, uh, hopefully later this summer. Uh, I've established 14 ministerial advisory committees, and in terms of professional sports, it's led by the former CEO and president of the Ottawa Senators, Cyril Leader. It's uh, co-chaired by the Canadian Football League's uh, Commissioner Randy Ponzi, and we have representatives from the Hamilton Tiger Caps, Maple Leaf Sports and Entertainment, as well as the Ottawa Sports and Entertainment Group, and I met earlier today with the uh, Ottawa Red Blacks. Wow. And the supplementary question. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and thank you, Minister. Residents in my riding of Mississauga Malton, who would normally tune into Hockey Night in Canada, are going to be thrilled with the prospect of NHL moving forward with Toronto as one of the two hub cities for the return of professional hockey. Times and times again, we heard the concern from the stakeholders during committee work, roundtables, and panel discussions. Minister, thank you for your leadership. You have been working hard to ensure that this return to play is allowed because our government and its health officials have continuously made this made the health and safety of all Ontarians the top priority during these tough times. Through you, uh, Mr. Speaker, the minister has proudly stated that 2021 will be a murky year for Ontario. More than ever, Ontario needs your leadership. Can the minister please share with us some of the great events that Ontarians can look forward to enjoying in the coming months? Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Heritage. Speaker, I've often challenged Ontarians to look forward to what does the next 18 months look like. My Ontario in 18 months has sports. It has professional sports. It has amateur sports. It also has high-performance athletes who will compete for Canada in the 2021 uh, Olympics. And so we are proud supporters of the Canadian Sport Institute of Ontario. We were the first jurisdiction in our country to allow our high-performance athletes back to training. We also uh, worked with our Toronto Raptors so that they would be a first among the nor in North America to start training in basketball. But 2021 is going to be a great year for sport in Ontario. We will be hosting the great Cup in Hamilton. We will be hosting the Ontario Summer Games in London. We will be hosting the 2020 Canada Games in Niagara and the 2022 Mississauga uh, Games in his community. He was there with me. And, and Mr. Speaker, we have so much more to offer. We represent uh, a spectacular double bottom line in this province. We obviously Response. represent $75 billion in economic activity, but we also represent gold medalists here and around the world. Hey. The next question, member for Toronto, Danforth. Thank you, Speaker. Speaker, my question to the Minister of Labour. On June 10th, two nooses were found hanging on construction equipment operated by black construction workers at the Michael Guerin Hospital construction site in East York. Toronto Police Services is carrying out a criminal investigation of the matter, 
understanding that they are dealing with a hate crime. Last week, the member for Beaches York, East York and I held a virtual public meeting in the East End to mobilize the community against this hate crime and to provide people with information. Speaker, through you to the Minister of Labour. The Ministry of Labour was asked to attend that meeting and speak to the issue, and they declined. Wow. Minister, your office was contacted directly, and I got no response. Why are hate crimes on job sites not a priority for you or your ministry? Wow. Minister of Labour. Speaker, uh, I can tell you that I will not tolerate any racism or any discrimination on any job site or in any workplace in the province of Ontario. <laughs> Mr. Speaker, I was actually proud uh, to stand with Premier Ford uh, last week, in fact, to say for the first time in the history of Ontario, we are providing online health and safety training free of charge to 100,000 workers in this province. Mr. Speaker, I'm also proud to report that uh, when it comes to that health and safety training, workplace harassment and violence uh, training is provided. We'll continue to use the full force of the law to protect every worker in this province from discrimination and from racism. Thank you. Um, I'm pleased that the minister has declared an interest in this issue. I note subsequently nooses have been found at three other construction sites. The message of anti-black hate is clear. Your ministry is responsible for workplace safety and the enforcement of anti-harassment measures. It's clear from talking to construction workers that this kind of harassment is a real and ongoing issue. And because of that very fact, their workplaces are unsafe. Speaker, again to the minister, what will you do immediately to take action and make these workplaces safe and free from harassment? Mr. Labour. Mr. Speaker, as I said, I will not tolerate any racism any discrimination on any job site or in any workplace right here in the province of Ontario. That concludes our question period for this morning.